Hey guys, JDR Exospace here. So I told you I wouldn't spend a lot of time on fake whistleblowers on this channel and people that is trying to seek attention. But my boy Eric Hecker went on the Sean Ryan show and he said so many crazy and absurd things that I, I just couldn't help myself and I had to make a follow up. So let's take a look at some of the things that he said and I'll show you why there's probably a state hospital somewhere that's wondering how this guy got out. You were in the South Pole from 2010 to 2011. Let's talk about what you were doing down there. You got it. What were you doing down there? I was contracted for the summer season as a plumber. I did well enough in my summer season to a garner plumber. a winter contract as well, which got me my full year's stay. I was also tasked with being a firefighter. I was a lead on the firefighting team. And because of that dual role capacity, I physically held a key that opened every single door in the facility. I had complete access to every compartment they manufactured. No, he didn't. If this was a top secret facility, this guy has no security clearance. He's not military. There's no way he would have had full security clearance to everything. He was a plumber hired to work on the sprinkler system and the plumbing. That's it. What is, what are you blowing the whistle on? That there are technologies at the South Pole Station that people can't even consider that exist on this planet. Like what? Directed energy weapon systems is something that people need to get into their vocabulary fast. The ice cube neutrino detector is not simply a passive listening device as presented. It is responsible for the earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand in 2011 on the front end of the year. How do you know for a fact that that was responsible for that? Because I was present and I have gone over this with the pertinent people that I will not be releasing their names. Okay. But I was on the team, let's just say, and I've confirmed this. So he's working at a National Science Foundation funded research facility in the South Pole. And he's claiming that this neutrino observatory at this research station is responsible for an earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand in 2010, 2011. So interestingly enough, there actually was an earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand when he says there was. But perhaps the unsurprising thing is that it was an earthquake in New Zealand. New Zealand happens to be located in what's called the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire is this ring pattern that follows tectonic plates around the Pacific Ocean that's known for earthquakes and volcanic activity, seismic activity. And the reason that is, if we look at this other diagram, New Zealand sits right along two major tectonic plates. And if you know even basic geology, earthquakes and seismic activity are caused by two tectonic plates grinding against each other as they move on the liquid mantle. So is it really that much of a surprise that an earthquake would happen in New Zealand? How do you know? I mean, how do you, what I, well, I guess what I'm asking is how did it even come to your attention that this triggered an earthquake? If you're at the South Pole and New Zealand had an earthquake, I mean, how did you know it came from the South Pole? Without divulging names? Without divulging names. I could only say that it was communicated to me from team members that were present and fully read in at the time that they were aware. And since that time, um, at the immediate, medic like the same day. Oh, absolutely. It was understood. Well, what was said that we accidentally hit Christchurch, New Zealand twice. This guy happened to be in Antarctica at the time of an earthquake and is saying with no evidence and no observations of his own that this facility caused an earthquake in New Zealand, which coincidentally happens to have occurred in a place that is known for volcanic and seismic activity. He's also claiming that aside from this being a neutrino observatory, it has several functions, the first of which is a directed energy earthquake generating weapon. So that's two functions and that's not even the full scope of what this thing's capable of as he's about to get into again. Let's talk about the, well, what else do they do? Uh, the device is also... Um for faster than light communications, quantum entangled communications at great distance. In, I guess it was the late 80s or early 90s, Gary McKinnon hacked NASA. And he found that we, he found the list of the off-world space fleet and the captains of the ships respectively. So we have a neutrino observatory, we have an earthquake generating weapon, and now we have faster than light communication to communicate with our space fleet. And once again, there's like these little nuggets of truth hidden away in some of the things that he's saying. So there actually was a UFO hacker. It wasn't in the late 80s and 90s, as he says in this interview. It was actually around 2001, around the time of 9-11. And I actually found an interview in Wired Magazine in 2006 with this guy, Gary McKinnon, and he gave a very interesting little tidbit of information that sheds some light on this story. So McKinnon himself says, I also got access to Excel spreadsheets during this hack. One was titled Non-Terrestrial Officers. It contained names and ranks of U.S. Air Force personnel who are not registered anywhere else. It also contained information about ship-to-ship -ship transfers, but I've never seen the names of this ship noted anywhere else. The reporter, could this have been some sort of military strategy game or outline of hypothetical situations? 
McKinnon. The military want to have military dominance of space. What I found could be a game. It's hard to know for certain. So again, what this guy, Eric Hecker, is citing is one Excel spreadsheet that this hacker found with the name non-terrestrial officers across it. And even he can't claim what it is for certain. That's what Eric Hecker is citing as evidence. Can you explain quantum entanglement communications? <laughs> yes, I don't think most people understand what I'm about to say anyway. <laughs> But I will. Um, the way quantum entanglement works is that you can take uh, you can take two particles, quantum entangle them, and then take those two particles and move them at any distance in the cosmos. And let's just say, for example, if you quantum entangle two electrons and you have them spinning in the same direction, and then you take one of those electrons and you shoot that thing out a hundred thousand light years from the original. If you then rotate the spin on the one electron, if you, if you modify it so that its spin changes, the quantum entangled electron at any distance will simultaneously in no time switch its rotation also because they're quantum entangled. So this is also a theme you're going to see across this interview is the is a theme of condescension as if he's smarter than everyone. His description of quantum entanglement essentially just detailed, well, quantum entanglement is when you quantum entangle something. But to summarize so far, we have earthquake generating weapon, neutrino observatory, faster than light communication, and wouldn't you know it, it does other things too. Uh, the ability to, let's just say, throw your voice into your head or my voice into my head or allowing algorithms that now they can blanket a whole geographical area and they can make everybody change their thoughts. They can, I, I use the term intrusive thoughts, um, back to that fork in the road analogy. If you find yourself where you have to make a decision about something, next thing you know, you catch yourself kind of having an argument in your head with your own voices. Well, the ability to um, add another one of your voices in there, but have it controlled by somebody else's microphone, so to say, is a very powerful tool. I think what this guy is describing is his own symptoms with paranoid schizophrenia. But we've arrived at the fourth function, and that is a thought control device, essentially the ability of this device to project thoughts into someone else's head in an attempt to control them. So four functions all in the same device at the same research facility, <laughs> oh man i don't even i don't even know if i have the energy to make it through this how are you finding all of this out years of research the mcdonald's corporation just had a uh... years of research he was at this facility for less than a year and we've got four different functions of this device so far four none of which he's actually seen operating extra low frequency uh, it's also a massive antenna that's embedded in the ice there when i arrived to the facility as a tradesman and firefighter, I was um, read into how everything worked because I needed for the safety of my crew to be able to battle fires and, and engage things appropriately. And at the onset, I was told that the ELF system is off. It's defunct. It's disabled. He said at various times in this interview that he was read into everything because he had full access. And then what he's about to describe here is a program that he wasn't read into. But through my uh, need to make an additional repair on something else and tracing back to a sub panel, I was finding the circuit that I needed to lock out, tag out, and do all the safe repairs. But then I noticed that this other breaker that was supposed to be off was in the on position and it was listed as the ELF. And I ran it up my chain. I said, what's going on here? I said, this is supposed to be off. I was told it's off now. And I was just given a hard, it's on. And that was the end of my need to know. So again, what he's claiming is whistleblower evidence is that he was assigned to fix a circuit breaker and noticed that there was another circuit breaker that wasn't supposed to be energized and it in fact was. And when he asked what it was, he was told, quit asking questions. You have your orders. Just fix what you were assigned to fix. That's it. At this point, I've lost count of the number of things that this device is supposed to be capable of, but he's claiming all these different functions with absolutely zero firsthand accounts or evidence that he's produced. And oddly enough, as we're about to see, he managed to get a lot of photos out of this super top secret facility engaged in all of this research and all these Death Star type weapons. Very interesting how he was just able to walk around this top secret facility and take a bunch of photos. They didn't want to tell me anything else. You, you have identified the circuit that you need to work on. You have been informed that you can safely do your job. Carry on. So I did my job. I made the repair that I needed to on the circuit next to the circuit that I was now informed is duly on and operating. So the ELF is up and running, and that, again, is a multifaceted directed energy weapons platform. He's saying this is a multifaceted weapons platform. He's never seen a weapon operate. He's never seen what he's even claiming is this ELF. Never seen it. He just saw a circuit breaker with the label ELF on it. 
that was energized. That's all he saw. That's like if I called an electrician out and I changed the label on my circuit breaker to Death Star laser beam and the electrician went to the news and said I had a Death Star laser beam in my backyard. Pictures of any of this stuff? I have a lot of pictures of me in these facilities. Um, Ooh, look at all the scary technology. Can, if you hand those over, I'll display them on screen right now. If I can get them. I can get you pictures before you present this to the world. I would appreciate that. It's very important that all of this information be presented to the world, as he keeps saying he has some kind of savior complex where he's trying to save the world. If this is some top secret facility with all of these different functions that nobody on Earth has ever heard of before, how was the plumber walking around all of these facilities with a key to everything, able to take all of these photos and just walk out with them? Seems odd, doesn't it? Let's talk about the clear air system called Aero. Yes. Commonly referred to as the no-fly zone. Yes. The Aero building, A-R-O, is the Atmospheric Research Observatory. It is listed on the chart, the one that I gave you as well, um, as a no-fly zone in the vaguest sense of the term at first glance. But as any pilot knows, there's always, you know, fine print. So the no-fly zone, as listed at the South Pole Station because of Arrow, simply provides a limit to the ability for a plane to fly too low. It sets the floor at 8,000 feet. You can't fly below. Ooh, look at that stealth feet. data acquisition. A that's, like a scary, that's a scary. That's a scary acronym. At South Pole Station, and there's a no-fly zone that protects from you flying in an area that'll see the hole, and that's just total shenanigans. The no-fly zone limits your ability to fly low, not high. So with that height available, you will see everything available to see, which is ice as far as the eye can see. There is no Ooh, aliens hole in the ice at the South Pole Station. There may be one somewhere else. I can't testify to the entirety of the continent. It's huge. All I can say is that when people are talking about there being a hole at the South Pole, they're full of crap. They don't know what they're talking about. They're taking something that they know very little about and just running with it. They <laughs> You literally can't make this up. All of these people with these conspiracy theories about a hole in Antarctica, they don't know what they're talking about. I've actually been there. I have special knowledge. Well, as we're about to see, he doesn't actually have special knowledge of anything at all. They say in other ways that, you know, a little information is a dangerous thing. And that's what pe these people are doing is they're operating off of very little information. The Atmospheric Research Observatory, as I testified uh, in D.C., I witnessed myself in doing my standard rounds in the winter season at South Pole Station that that building would, with great regularity, have a very powerful green laser beam shooting out of it into the cosmos. A green laser beam? Well, that sounds legitimate. That sounds scary. What could that possibly be? Let's continue. He's about to, he's about to reveal all if we just stay patient. I believe through other things that I've located there, which is the... Um, the chilled helium in a massive amount. It is chilled down to four degrees Kelvin in storage, which my understanding, this is something new that I'm learning about. It's called superfluids. Superfluids act very differently than other things in our scientific spectrum and are used for things called chemical lasers. Well, we had a superfluid and we had a laser. So I believe that what I'm learning on this is that it was probably a secondary means of long range communication and or another weapons platform. Okay, I've had about enough of this crap. Okay, so we saw a green laser and liquid helium, right? That sounds super scary if you have no idea what it is. Now, another thing to note is none of this stuff is particularly secret. You can find on the National Science Foundation website all the information you want about all of these programs. It shows facilities here. It shows where they are. You can even go here to this Aero Building website, that he, to the Aero Building webpage, and you could see exactly what they study. You can even scroll down to the bottom and they even give you a full map, a full blueprint of the entire facility, including what each room is used for. And one thing I found interesting on this website is what they're actually studying at this facility. Two things specifically that are of note for liquid helium and lasers. NASA, the Goddard Space Flight Center, is studying two programs in particular. They're measuring aerosols and cloud structure, 
and they're measuring aerosol optical depth. Now, what does optical mean? Light, visual. Now, some of the equipment you might be interested in using, for example, if you were doing a study measuring aerosol concentrations at different elevations, would be calibration equipment using a laser so that you could calibrate at different depths and have a light source to calibrate it against. Now, I'm no astrophysicist, but one thing I do have a lot of experience with is reading peer-reviewed literature. Now, it took me about 20 minutes of scanning some of the peer-reviewed literature to figure out exactly why you might need lasers and liquid helium for neutrino observatory experiments, or for example, measuring aerosol optical depths. For example, here's an article in the Nuclear Instruments and Methods in Physics Research Journal titled Optical Calibration Hardware for the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. The optical properties of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory heavy water Cherenkov neutrino detector are measured in situ using a light diffusing sphere laser ball. The laser ball is remotely manipulated to many positions in the D2O and H2O volumes where data at six different wavelengths are acquired. These data are analyzed to determine the absorption and scattering of light in the heavy water and light water and the angular dependence of the response of the detector's photomultiplier tubes. Here's another research paper conducted by Cornell University entitled Characterization of the TrueSense S310 Laser Range System for Contactless Measurement of Liquid Levels in Large Volume Neutrino Detectors. Neutrino experiments often use large volumes of water, organic scintillators, or noble liquids as active detection material. What is helium? Helium is a noble gas. Noble gases such as helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, etc. are all in the group in the periodic table called noble gases. Noble gases have a full electron valence shell, which means they neither donate nor accept electrons. In effect, meaning they're virtually chemically inert so that they don't react with other chemicals very easily except under extreme conditions. So they're very useful in certain experiments, such as for neutrino detectors. Here's another website from the Brookhaven National Laboratory talking about their instrumentation division, and they are describing noble liquids and gases playing a leading role in the design and readout for Protodune, the proof of principle detector for the deep underground neutrino experiment. So you can find multiple places where they're conducting this type of research that tells you exactly what these lasers and liquid helium are for. This is not a Death Star weapon, it's not an earthquake generating weapon, and it is not allowing faster than light communication with our space fleet. It is rather mundane but highly technical research which this person Eric Hecker has no knowledge of. I was able to find this information on the internet in 20 minutes. If Mr. Hecker is so knowledgeable of these facilities, why has it taken him 10 years and he still can't figure out what these are for? And you think that might be a communication device? How would they be communicating with the laser? I, I don't understand the science of it. I just know that it exists. Okay. The laser, laser beam communication, direct line of sight, laser beam comms, microwave type comms, it exists. There is the laser beam right there right on the front page of the National Science Foundation website. Why would they post a weapon on the front page of the website? I don't know how this guy even got on the stage with some of these other whistleblowers. An agreement signed by 12 nations in which Antarctic, the Antarctic continent was made demilitarized to be preserved for scientific research. What do you think about that? I think it's a load of malarkey. And I'm gonna throw a gentleman's name out there that I have worked with. Another whistleblower? He told me very specifically at the time that we communicated. He's going to die when he sees this video. I worked with a gentleman by the name of Aaron Bontrager, and he was also previously contracted by Raytheon Polar Services as a cook. He was the cook! I... The plumber responsible for fixing the sprinkler system was talking to the cook, and that's how he knows about all of these top secret programs and what they were doing and looking for nuclear missile silos. I'm not even gonna play the rest of this because I don't have the patience for this. If you wanna go watch the rest of this crap, I'll link it for you in the description so you can go watch the full interview yourself. I'm not gonna play any more of this because this is so patently absurd. I'm not a psychologist, but if I was, I imagine that this guy would receive a diagnosis of narcissistic pathology with delusions of grandeur. He claims to be smarter than everyone and have all this firsthand experience and information, but he hasn't seen anything, even in his own testimony. He doesn't claim to have seen anything out of the ordinary. His evidence essentially amounts to, I saw an optical laser, a calibration tool, and I saw a circuit breaker that was energized when it wasn't supposed to be energized. That is the extent of his evidence and whistleblower testimony. I'm extraordinarily disappointed that I have to cover people like this and that they end up on the same stage as other people who may have actually seen something who had real credentials. This guy probably is missing from a state hospital somewhere and probably needs to be locked back up. You know, some of you in the comments might get upset at me for covering this topic and going so hard on this guy, but I don't particularly care. I'm gonna tell you the truth whether you agree with me or not, and this is the problem with hardcore UFO believers is that they want to believe everything so badly that they're willing to believe everything. He read about some crazy shit in some dark places on the internet and is 
come up with all these theories and connected all these dots of which he has no supporting evidence. This takes me back to Stephen Greer. When you have other whistleblowers that may have actually seen something and you bring quacks like this on, it undermines all of your credibility. And I don't know a whole lot about Sean Ryan. I've seen some of his stuff. He seems to be doing great work with veterans. But Sean, I got to tell you, man, if you bring people like this on, it undermines your credibility with any other story you're going to cover. This guy has delusions of grandeur and he's only doing this so he can get on TV because nobody else is taking him seriously. Please don't make the mistake of thinking that just because there are other whistleblowers that come forward that all of them are credible. This guy clearly is not. Don't forget to do your due diligence. That's all I have for you guys in this video because I think that's about all I can take. So I will catch you guys on the next one.